Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yep, okay, cool. Uh, no, I have to say, it's, I'm not going to talk specifically about the NSA or NSA proofing your passwords because um, I'm not personally sure exactly um, how it is that they're reading everything. But, uh, yeah. They're probably listening right now anyway. They're probably listening anyway. Yeah, yeah. So if they want to, to let us know, then they can just jump in. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, passwords. Um, I'm going to talk about the kinds of problems that we've seen um, with pa that we see with passwords and what we can do about, about this. Now, the first problem that uh, we notice with passwords is that they're really hard to secure. If you've been following the news recently, you will have noticed a number of high-profile companies apologizing publicly after getting hacked and seeing their, pass their users' passwords posted on page bins on the internet, right? Now, I could pick on these companies, make fun of them for not following best practices, whatever. But the reality is that this shit is really hard. If you want to store passwords in your database, it's really hard to do well. You have to use a secure hash algorithm. You have to use per user sold values. You have to use a site secret that's outside of the database. You have to use password, proper password and lockout policies to prevent online brute forcing attacks. You have to use a secure recovery mechanism, so when your passwords, your users forget their passwords, they have a way to get back to it, but it's just as strong as the rest, otherwise attackers will attack that. But the real problem with this list, other than it takes a lot of effort to do this, is that these are the 2013 password guidelines. In five years, I can guarantee you that there's, there's going to be a couple more bullets. There's going to be more stuff you have to do, because this is an arms race between you, the site owner, and the attackers trying to steal your passwords. So passwords are really a liability for you as a site owner. It'd be really nice to just be able to get rid of them. Now, I don't recommend you run this just now. <laughs> <coughs> Users might have problems logging into your site, if, it, if that's all you do. Um, the other problem, of course, is that passwords are hard to remember. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's not such a big problem because all browsers have uh, password managers built in. There's a bunch of products you can buy that will sync your passwords across devices, things like that. But we've done user research on that particular topic at Mozilla, and users, the average user out there doesn't use a password manager for a variety of reasons. When they do use a password manager, it's one of these. So not exactly <laughs> the kind of password manager <laughs> that we encourage people to use, right? Um, so what do users do? Well, they have a really good strategy. They pick an easy password. If you do that, that problem goes away entirely. It becomes easy to remember your password. This is a top 500 password, by the way. Um, so it's a bit depressing to look at this picture, really. Um, and, but, the, but there's another strategy that makes it even easier, and that is just reuse it everywhere. You pick an easy one, and you use it on every single site. And now, that problem is completely disappears. You don't need password managers. You just have one password, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well, if one of, if one of these sites gets hacked and your password is, 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 uh, is extracted from it, then you're kind of screwed all over the place. Not a good position to be in, right? So I don't recommend this. Now, another thing about passwords being hard to remember is that users will forget them. Right? So you're going to have to have some reset mechanism on your site. What does that usually look like? Usually, it involves some kind of email loop. Like, a user will type in their email, their username, and then you send them an email with a reset link. Come back to your site, and they type in a new password, that kind of stuff. Right? That's pretty common. Um, what this means, though, is that if you control someone's email account, you control all of their accounts. Right? Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, because if you have a very strong email password, if you use, for example, Gmail and you do use two-factor auth, then actually your email account is pretty strong. Right? It's, it's, uh, it, that, that might be an improvement. Uh, I'm just saying that this is the current state of things. Right? If, you, if you control someone's email already today, you can get access to all of their accounts through the reset functionality. Now, here's an alternative to passwords. You can use social logins. Those are the two, probably the two most popular. So basically what you do is you outsource all of your password problems to a third-party company. Now, there's an obvious problem with this, right? What do you do with users that don't have a Facebook account or a Twitter account? You're not actually asking your users to create a Facebook account just to log into your website, right? That would be, that would be incredibly painful 
because it's, it takes quite some time to create a Facebook account, right? And just to log into your site, they're not going to do that. So you're basically locking out these users. But the other thing is that you're locking out more than the users that only have, that, that don't have these accounts. You're also locking out about 15% of users that do have a Facebook account, but are not going to use it to log into your site the first time. And um, it turns out that a lot of users don't want to share all that much information with you because when you log in with Facebook, their perception is that you're going to know all their friends, you're going to know all their secrets, you're going to be able to spend their wall, whatever, and they don't trust you the first time they come to your site. So they're just going to go away if you don't have a, a, another mechanism. And you know, 10, 15% is, a, is, a, is quite a big number for sites. So you need some kind of backup mechanism. So you're probably back to passwords again. And the whole idea of this was to avoid passwords. So kind of crappy. OpenID is really interesting because OpenID brought back the idea that identity on the web, authentication, should be decentralized. And I think that's, that's a great idea because I think users should be able to choose who their identity provider is. They basically choose who they trust with their authentication. And also, they should be able to be their own identity provider if they don't trust anybody. Um, so OpenID allows that. The problem with OpenID, though, um, one of the main problems is of user experience. This is what an OpenID typically looks like. It's a URL. Now, you may not find that it's such a big problem. And within a like, sort of geek crowd, we're all kind of like, well, yeah, it's a URL. That works for me and probably works for you as well, but it doesn't work for the average user out there. It's been tried, there's lots of problems. And what did sites do to work around this sort of failure of dealing with URLs? They did something like this. They said, oh wait, well take the URL away, and then I'll just use the, the 13 most popular OpenID providers or whatever. Now, it works for them, sort of, but there's a really important thing that's missing. It's the decentralization thing, you know, the fact that a user can choose who their identity provider is. Now you can no longer make that choice because you're restricted to whichever providers that this site picked. And in fact, that didn't even work because that's been dubbed the NASCAR screen. And, and users find it confusing, so a lot of sites have just said, oh, screw it, I'll just use the top two. Right? Not a very good story. But the, re the, the, the more fundamental reason why uh, we, Mozilla, couldn't get behind OpenID really is one of privacy. And um, the best way to understand the privacy problem with OpenID is, is through this analogy. Imagine that the next time you check into a hotel, when they ask to see your driver's license, what if they actually phoned up the DMV to make sure that the ID is valid, right? Well, what that would mean is that the government would then have a trail of every hotel you've checked into, right? They would have that data directly into the the database, which is pretty creepy. Although, of course, the NSA knows everything. Yeah. But, um, but the DMV would also know without asking the NSA. Um, the other thing is that the DMV, or the government in general, would have the ability, based on other information they have, to deny you that hotel stay. They could say, for example, you've got way too many parking tickets or, or speeding tickets or something like that. You know, you should, you should pay those first before you go to expensive hotels. So they could say, no, that's not a valid ID, and then you'd be denied that state. Now, that's a bit of a stretch, of course, but this is exactly the kind of power you're giving to an OpenID provider. That's how OpenID is kind of structured, uh, unless you, you, you are your own OpenID provider. But we can't expect the average web user to be their own OpenID, uh, OpenID uh, provider. So basically, the existing login systems are not good enough for the web. What would the ideal web-wide system look like? Well, just like OpenID, it would be decentralized. I think we can't have a system where there's a central gatekeeper for the internet, and that that gatekeeper and their terms of conditions determine whether or not you can log into arbitrary websites, right? That's, I think that's a really important point. Use, we need this for user choice. The other thing is that this needs to be really simple, because if it, if it doesn't have a great user experience, users are not going to want to use it, or they will fail, and then they will like, increase the support costs for websites, things like that. And if users don't like it, website owners are not going to, you know, not going to adopt it. But also, it needs, to, it needs to be simple for developers, because if it's not simple for developers, there's no chance it will ever be secure. And finally, we're no longer in 2003, 
Internet Explorer is no longer, no longer has 93% market share. So this system needs to work on all of the browsers that people use and all of the devices that they use as well. So it needs to be cross-browser. Now what I want to talk about today is a system that we've been working on called Persona. Persona has these three uh, characteristics. How does it work? At the core of it, Persona is based on verified email addresses. So if I can prove to you that I own this email address, you the site owner, then I can just prove the same thing next time I want to log into the website and then you'll recognize me and you'll let me in based on that proof. Now, how does, that, how does the proof work? Well, the proof would come from the authority for that domain. So the authority for Gmail is of course Google. So if I can get a proof from Google that I own this email address, then you should let me in. That's sort of the basic idea. Now I'm gonna show you, we're gonna do a little demonstration with two volunteers of how the protocol actually works. So can you please sign off? Thank you. So Dietrich here will be, um, the, will be the identity provider, Gmail in this case. I'm, go I'm going to be uh, the browser uh, trying to log in to Wikipedia, which is also over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm the browser and I'm going to generate a, uh, a new identity for that email address. So I'm going to generate a public and a private key in the browser and uh, that, that will be my little certificate here. Now what I want is I want this signed by Gmail. So I'm gonna walk over to Gmail. Hello Gmail, could Hello. I get a signature on this please? Yes, what is your password please? Password? But with a zero instead of the O and an at sign instead of the A. <laughs> Uh, it's legit. <laughs> I will sign this certificate with my private key. Because, <laughs> and as you can see, private keys are red, as we all know. Thank you very much, Gmail. So I've got this certificate now in the browser. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to log into Wikipedia. But I'm going to create first a little bundle called an assertion. Now the assertion will have uh, two things on it. It will have an audience field which is uh, basically the URL of the website I'm trying to log into. So wikipedia.org, and it has an expiry. So I'm, I'm gonna say it expires in about two minutes. There you go. So that's my assertion. I'm gonna put in the certificate. There we go. And I'm gonna use this to sign into Wikipedia. Now, just before I do that, the point of the audience, that's pretty important, the point of the audience is that I don't want Wikipedia to be able to then turn around and use this to impersonate me on other websites. So because I've got the audience field in here that's, that's locked to Wikipedia, if, it try, if Wikipedia, if Austin tries to impersonate me elsewhere, they're gonna check the audience and, and see that it's not actually for them. So it's very important to put it here. Hello Wikipedia, can I log in please? Hello. Wikipedia, it's for me. It expiry, it expires in a minute and a half from now. Okay. Let's see here. Francois from Gmail, huh? Gmail. <laughs> Hello, Gmail. Hey, how's it going? Good. Can I have your public key? Yeah, hold on one second. Yep, yellow. So notice here that uh, when Austin went to see Dietrich to uh, ask for the public key, he didn't actually reveal who was trying to log in to the site. He was just asking for the public key that's the same for everybody. I don't know who's trying to log in. <laughs> Proof. All right. Signature, the signature is valid. And you're in my database. Welcome back, Francois. And I'd like to give you a tasty session cookie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. So there you go. Um, Persona replaces the username and password check. As you can see with the tasty session cookie, all the rest is the same uh, from, from that point on. Now, let's see what it actually looks like on the web. So I'm going to give you a demo. Leave the mic here. Actually, I'm just going to turn it off.
Okay. Yes. All right, so let's see this demo. So this is the Times uh, crossword puzzle in the, uh, so a newspaper in the UK. And they use persona for logins. So I'm going to click login here. And I'm going to sign in with an email address. It ends with id.me. And id.me supports persona natively. So I click next. And then if you look in the URL bar, it's an id.me page. So I'm authenticating with id.me. So it was just like when I told uh, Dietrich my password. Um, so I'm going to sign in here. And so it was the right password. Now I got a signature on my certificate. It's in the browser. And now I'm going to use that to sign into the website. So there you go just using my normal id.me password. Now, the point of this demo was to show you that Persona is today a decentralized system. All of this works when you have native support in, in the identity provider. Now, decentralization is really important, but it's not a product adoption strategy because we can't just wait until every single uh, email provider out there or domain supports Persona natively before we get started. Otherwise, we'll wait forever, and nobody's going to be interested in our system. So what we did to work around this is that we created this temporary centralized fallback. If the domain you're trying to sign into doesn't, or, or the domain of your email address doesn't have native Persona support, then we have a fallback that will make it work anyways. And let's see how that works with, uh, by logging into Slowblock. So there you go. I'm going to try to post something here. And I need to sign in first. This time, I'm going to use a Gmail address. So it's asking me to pick a password. There we go. So this is the fallback identity provider. And the fallback identity provider needs, before it signs things on behalf of Gmail, it needs to verify that it actually controlled that email address. So it's just sent me an email. And so if I click refresh here, I've got an email from Persona. It's got a unique link. And it's got a unique token. I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, but it's got a unique token that identifies me with uh, Persona. So by clicking on it, that confirms to Persona that uh, I own this email address. And that's, that's probably familiar to most of you. That's how almost every website out there verifies that you control an email address. And now if, you go, if I go back to Slowblog, I'm logged in to the site using that email address. So it works today with all email domains through uh, this fallback. Now, we can do better than just a fallback, though. The fallback makes it work for everything. But there are some rather large um, identity providers out there, large email providers out there, um, that have some kind of API. Like, for example, Yahoo speaks OpenID. And um, what we've built for Yahoo is an identity bridge that will um, talk OpenID to Yahoo and speak browser ID. Browser ID is a protocol behind Persona um, to your browser. So I'll show you how that works with the third demo here. So I'm going to sign in to Reason Well. And this time, I'm going to use a Yahoo address. So now the bridge is going to take me to the real Yahoo login page. And sign in to Yahoo. And there you go. So completed the OpenID flow, which means that I control this email address. And now the bridge signs the assertion on uh, the certificate on behalf of Yahoo and I'm logged in. So we have that for uh, Yahoo. And um, very soon, so that works already in production, as you could see. Um, but in the next few weeks, we're going to have it for Gmail as well. And um, then in the next few months, we're going to have it for uh, Hotmail too. So uh, 
once we have those three, we, our estimate is that for most sites out there, about 80% of your users will have this sort of near native uh, flow in uh, Persona. Now, the demos I've given you were using different browsers, and that was to just emphasize the fact that Persona works today in all modern browsers, both on desktop and also on mobile. So it's decentralized, simple, and cross-browser. Now, I've showed you that it was pretty simple for, the, for users, but how about for developers? How easy is it to add to your own site? So in order to give you a feel for um, how hard it is or how easy it is to add Persona, I'm going to uh, pick a random uh, person from the audience. How about you, Austin? <laughs> to, uh, to code up, uh, a, so basically create a, a little web app and then add sessions to it and then uh, do those sessions with Persona. So, what, so Austin is going to write this Node.js application and um, it's going to start from scratch. It's going to be an express application. And right now he's just writing the, some boring sort of boilerplate code. Um, that's essentially just the, um, the, the uh, hello world for, uh, for express. So we have one, we're defining one route and we're just returning some uh, HTML when uh, the browser hits that route. Now, we're gonna make this fun and uh, we're gonna say that it's a um, social uh, networking application of some kind because um, that's all that VC people are funding these days, it seems. And so, um, Oh, he's got to install the Express plugin. There you go. <laughs> Don't look at this. <laughs> this is to make the demo typo proof. <laughs> All right, uh, let's have a look at it. Um, you might want to shut down Firefox first, just to clear the cookies. All right, let's look at port 3000, see our application. There we go. Welcome to the future Socializer 3000. Okay, so that was just a hello world thing. Now let's add uh, sessions to it. So we've got a little bit of uh, middleware to add. <laughs> there we go. That's just to reduce the amount of typing. Um, so a couple of middleware, uh, something to parse. So we're going to use cookies for sessions here. So we have a, a, a cookie parser, and then there's a session middleware that actually uh, does the sessions. And don't look at the secret key here. Okay, so what this is going to do is now it's going to separate users into two classes, the, uh, the logged in users and the logged out users. So there's gonna be, if there is a user variable defined in the session here, then we're going to show the logged in user page, which also has a logout button. And if the user is not logged in, if there's, if there's no user defined, then we're going to show the, uh, the logged out page. which will have a login button instead. Now this is not using Persona yet, we're just setting, setting ourselves up to, uh, to have um, just normal logins, well, which is arguably a little bit fake here in this case, because we're not even asking for a password, we're using a password, but we'll do that shortly. So we're defining two extra routes, slash login, which is what happens when you click on the login link. And we're, in this case, we're just gonna hard code the user that you're logging in as, and then we'll redirect to the home page. And the logout route will be uh, almost exactly the same, except that uh, we'll be clearing the user uh, variable instead.
All right, that looks good. So let's make sure that this works. By cheating again. Okay, so now we have a login button. That's a logged out page, and that's a login, logged in page. Hmm, I'm not sure you overrode that file. <laughs> All right. So um, now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start adding persona support to it. So OK, so the first thing you have to do when you want to add persona support to your site is that you have to add a, uh, a new, um, you have to load an external piece of JavaScript. And it'll be this one right there. So the, it's called uh, login.persona.org slash include.js. Now this is what sets up the, uh, the required functions in the browser. So this is, this is what sets up browser support if your browser doesn't support persona natively. So, um, and then that will define a bunch of functions that we'll use uh, a bit later on. Uh, the next thing is jQuery. That's not required, but um, it will make uh, the Ajax calls a little bit nicer in this demo. Uh, Firefox has the beginning of it, but um, Austin is working on this, so it's not, it's not fully done yet. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so the first, um, so after setting, after loading this include.js file, what you do is you call the setup function. The setup function is called navigator.id.watch, right here. And the setup function takes three um, parameters, or, or th there's three things that you need to define when you call it. The first one is logged in user. You're just telling basically. Uh, you're telling Persona which user is currently logged in. And, uh, and if nobody's logged in, you're just passing null. The next thing is to define a callback called onLogin. This is what happens when um, it's time to log a user in to your site. And so here, Persona will call this and then with an assertion, and then you have to do something with the assertion. Now what you do is, of course, you have to verify that the assertion is valid. And, um, but you can't do that on the client, of course, because you can't trust the client to not lie about having done the verification. So what, we, what we're doing here is we're just posting the, uh, the assertion that we got back to our server, and then we'll do the, the, the verification down there. That's fine, That's fine because he's going to cheat anyways. <laughs> You're going to post the assertion back to your own server? Back to your own server, yes. And the, the, last, the third piece, the last piece in the setup function is onLogout. OnLogout is what happens when uh, Persona wants you to log the user out. So in this case, we're going to, uh, well, that's actually an important typo. That should be slash logout. So what we're going to do here is we're simply going to redirect to the logout page, and that will take care of uh, deleting the, the user variable from uh, the, se the, session, um, the, the, the session cookie, basically. So okay, so that's uh, that's what we did. Now the the third piece will be to change what the logout and login buttons do. So instead of redirecting to uh, those those routes on our site. Oh, and then um, that's just setting the login user as well. The variable that we use down there. There you go. So now we have to change that logout button. So what you need to uh, call when uh, the user wants to log out is navigator.id.logout. So all those navigator.id.something functions, this is what is defined in include.js or natively by the browser if you have native support. Um, and so navigator.id.logout is what you call for, it, for to log the user out. Persona will then trigger your uh, on logout callback when that happens. And then uh, for the login button, you just call navigator.id.request. No parameters needed. This is what brings up the, the persona pop-up that you've seen uh, in the demos. So let's see what this does. Cheating. 
All right. OK, so now we can log in. It brings up the persona pop-up. Austin is going to log in. Now, this is a domain that has native support for persona. So this is the IDP that Austin runs on his own machine. <laughs> I'm a little nervous so I'm checking my I'm not I'll sign out I'm going to go Ah uh, no you do have to use that one oh, I do have to Yeah because you hard coded the thing <laughs> That's a long password it's Secure <laughs> Yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're logged in, and that's the email address there. We click the logout button, and there we go. We're logged out. We're automatically redirected to the page. OK, so now let's do um, persona properly. Let's actually, so right now we were cheating because we hard-coded the email address. Now the, the last piece that we have to do is we have to pull the email address out of the assertion that we got. So we need to verify the assertion and uh, extract the email address from there. So let's do that. What we, there's, there's many ways you can verify assertions. Um, one way is to uh, do the folder protocol, do the crypto work yourself, and, and verify everything on your own server. Um, another way is to use a library that does, that does that for you. Uh, and then a third way, which is the way that we're going to show here because it's shorter for the demo, is to use an online verification service that we run where uh, basically what all, you, all you do is you post the assertion that you got from the user to our service along with your audience, and then we'll tell you, we'll do the verification for you and tell you uh, whether or not it was a successful, uh, it, it was a valid assertion. Um, of course, that's over HTTPS. So what Austin is doing here is he's just tweaking a little bit the, uh, the, what happens in the Ajax call, uh, because now we may get an error. We, before, we, didn't, we weren't actually checking assertions, so we, we didn't get any logging errors, but if, uh, if you get an invalid assertion, you need to call uh, navigator.id.logout to uh, clear everything. So that's what he's doing there. Otherwise, the rest of the JavaScript code there is exactly the same. So what we need to do here is um, when, uh, so the, the login function is what gets the assertion that we post back to ourselves. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to take the assertion we, uh, we get, and we're going to send it to the online verifier. A verifier is at verifier.login.persona.org slash verifier. So the path is slash verifier. And this is just a bunch of boilerplate from Node. There you go. Now, here, what, what's happening here is that uh, we're sending to the verifier a, a body variable, which we haven't defined yet. But the body variable will be simply the audience that we received and the, uh, sorry, the assertion that we received and the audience for our service. So that's the one that comes from the post that we got. And then the audience is... Um, should not come from the headers. It should come from your, the configuration of your server or something like that. Oh, QS is query string. So that we're encoding a query string that we're sending uh, in this post. Now, the other thing is that the, um, at the very bottom of this requesting, there was a callback that, that was uh, called unverified response. Um, right here, I don't know if you saw it, but, oh, well, yeah. 
this page down. Again? Oh, there it is. So this is what gets called when, when the call returns. It's an asynchronous call. So now we're defining this, um, this uh, function here. Um, the bit up at the bottom is, is uh, boring boilerplate, uh, which will eventually go away in future versions of Node, I think, I believe. But this is the meat of the, of the call here. Now we're parsing the, the response that we got from the verifier. So the verifier sends us a JSON response. And it's got two fields that are of interest to us. The first one is uh, status. So if the status says OK, then the assertion is valid. And then the other thing that's interesting in this assertion, in, in this response, is email. So we get a status field and an email field in the case of a valid assertion. And that tells us who the user is. At that point, we have a valid assertion. Everything is fine. We can log the user in. If we don't get a valid assertion, if we don't get status OK, we're going to get status failed. And then we'll also have, a, in the response, we'll have a, a reason, so a text reason for why the assertion failed. For example, the, the assertion had expired or something like that. Uh, the important thing to note here is that if you have an invalid assertion, you're not going to get the email field. So you cannot accidentally log a user in because you don't even know who that user is. So. Nice, nice little thing. So, all right, let's try this one. Oh, I know you're missing a node module. There you go. Let's try again. And let's see what that looks like. OK, so let's try logging in. There we go, logged in as user. Now, just to make sure that it really works this time, we'll log in with a different user. There you go. Uh, next week it will. <laughs> we're, we're actually deploying the, the code for that now. <laughs> so there you go. That's how you add Persona. So thank you, Austin. So just to recap, you load an external piece of JavaScript. You set up the login and logout callbacks in the setup function called navigator id.watch. Then you hook your login and logout buttons. And finally, you verify the assertion server side. So it's just easy, four easy steps to add to your own app. So I want to leave you with one simple request, and that is stop making the problem worse. Specifically, I mean, if, you have, if you're building a new site, default to Persona. I'm not saying you should use Persona all the time. I'm just saying don't default to asking users for another password and a, and a username on your site. There's no excuse in 2013 to do that again. So just default to Persona, and if you have a good reason to use something else, use something else. That's fine. If you're working on an existing site, please add support for Persona. It doesn't have to replace your other things. It can work quite nicely. We have a bunch of sites that are using it alongside uh, Facebook, Twitter, other things like that. Um, but you could replace your, uh, your, your sort of email and password fallback if you wanted to. But yeah, please add support for Persona. Now, it, we're gonna, Austin and I are going to be here uh, all day tomorrow. If you want to, any help um, adding it to your site, we can help you do that. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to come to us. We'll be happy to uh, spend a bunch of hours with you, um, or 10 minutes if it only takes 10 minutes. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes. Like you've got a bootstrap public key infrastructure there, which makes me wish for uh, something like a navigator.id.find function so that I could like, create an app to create PHP signatures. Uh, can, can we do that? So the question was not a question, it was a comment or a feature request. Can we uh, use that infrastructure to, uh, to have basically public key uh, encryption signatures and stuff like that for email um, using GPG? Um, that's something I would really like to see personally. Um, 
haven't had time to, to play with that yet. Uh, but yeah, um, it's not something that, that's, that's planned for, the, for, for Persona itself. But, um, but I think, I think we, we have an opportunity um, once you know, there's a lot of people on board to, to do something pretty cool. Yeah. At the very least, I think when you have this, um, when you're exchanging keys like this, like in the assertion there's a public key for the user, um, the, the site that receives it could, if, if, the, if the identity provider um, kept, like for example, in the case of, of something like Gmail, for example, they could hold the, the private key for the user and then, the, but the site would be able to encrypt stuff, which would be decrypted by Gmail, for example. So, in transit, it would be encrypted. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a few things like that that could, could be explored. It's a good idea. So, so I realize that you include .js, especially a polyfill, in the mm -hmm. browser support. So Correct. Um, but the initial login step, everything is being routed to persona.org. And you mentioned one of the disadvantages of OpenID is that your identity provider knows everywhere that you're logging in. Doesn't Persona.org now know everywhere that I'm logging in using Persona? I mean, if everything is being routed to that, now is Persona.org itself also just a polyfill? Or so? The, per, okay, the it, it doesn't seem decentralized. It seems centralized mm -hmm. on the domain Persona.org. So the question, the question was, what, is it really decentralized? It's, it, looks, it looks fairly centralized. Um, the, the components that are centralized right now, um, there's three. There's um, the uh, include.js, that is basically the, the polyfill for the browser. So that, that goes away when there's native support in the browser. Second thing is the fallback identity provider. That's there with the account and you have to log in and things like that on persona.org. That goes away if you have a, um, if, if you have native support uh, in your email provider. So if you, like in the case of Austin, you know he doesn't have an account on, on the fallback identity provider because he's got his own thing doing the authentication. The third component, which is where we, ac we actually would get a log of everywhere you're going as a user, just like OpenID, is for sites that decide to do verification using our own online verifier. Now, I can tell you that we don't actually keep the logs. That's our, in our privacy policy. We no, you, you, you can actually do your own verification. That's the sure, thing. Sure. Yep. But step two, where he, if his own the, the fallback for the email address? So the, the part where you enter your email address and you do yes. discovery on the domain to see if that domain... That will be in the browser. Like when, when we have native support, that will be in the browser. Okay. So in particular, uh, what I think he's talking about is the dialogue. Yeah, the, the yes. pop-up dialogue. Yep. That will, that will, yes, that's, that's the polyfill. That will go away. Gotcha. And that will be like a, a piece of browser Chrome if uh, when when we have data support, yeah. And then that will go directly to it will do, directly discover so the the, the identity provider. Locally, or the client, client, yeah, client. It will be client discovery goes to the IDP directly. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry, you trust your browser and you trust your identity provider, right? Yes. 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 Which, which is already the case for any authentication system. If you have a, a, a hijacked browser, there's no way around it. Uh, get a new browser. If, you have, if, someone hij if your email provider reads your email and, and uses, use, you know, can, can control, they can basically log in as, as you on Facebook if they want to pay. So, yeah. so I do my own email. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, I mean, you can grab the code that he's running. It's on GitHub. <laughs> that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, uh, it, it. It depends if you want to write all the crypto code yourself or if you, you reuse someone else's library. Like, I think Austin reused the library that we use in, in, the, in the polyfill to, uh, to do his uh, signature signing and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, there's browser ID. So if, if you're if you're using that, then it's it's pretty easy. Okay. Yep. You mentioned the browser support coming in the future. What about Android and iPhone? Like, what type of difference? Mm -hmm. So on uh, mobile, the question is on mobile, like how do, how does it work? Um, if you so a lot of applications will th there's there's people using it on mobile already. They they will pop up like a, a browser window and ask you to log in that, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then typically they will only ask you to log in. One, and then it's sort of like with uh, applications that use OAuth, they'll set a token on your device and then they'll never ask you to log in again, um, sort of thing. So some people do that. 
Um, we're also uh, thinking about having like native SDKs and stuff like that for iOS and, and Android, but um, that I mean, like we're, they're not ready yet. Um, do you, do you know anything more about this? Or? The code exists for iOS, um, but no one's active. No, I, there's not an active maintainer on it, and it could get to a finished state. And uh, so people are hacking on Android a little bit. Yep. Uh, is there potential for an open ID to bridge? Is there potential for an open ID to bridge? Um, we well. So we're, we're based on, on email addresses. If you're talking about, like, I think there's an OpenID Connect or something like that that does have, like, a web finger type of thing. Um, that, uh, that's interesting. Like, we want to expand the identity bridging that we've got to cover more uh, email providers. Um, we made it out in the future. Uh, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a good idea. As as people add support, like as email addresses come on board, yep. Oh, there's no difference to you as a user. Yep. So the question was, if if I'm using Persona now and my email provider doesn't have native support, um, and I, I log into a bunch of websites, create accounts, will that work after that uh, website that that email provider switches to natively supporting Persona? Uh, absolutely, because the website only gets an email address, and that's what they use. Also, the, the same thing is true for um, sites that use Persona now, that there's no native support in browsers. That's irrelevant. Uh, nothing will change as far as the site is concerned. Yep. You mentioned how it's awesome that like, Gmail has uh, two-factor auth. Mm -hmm. So which persona identity providers support uh, two-factor auth currently? Um, so with the, so, so Gmail would be one once we have the, the Gmail bridge um, running. Um, I mean like today, so. Oh, like, you mean like native support, native support. and, and, and two-factor auth? Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that's something that we're interested in. Like, probably through the, the Google Authenticator um, stuff. But yeah, that's definitely something that we'd like to see in, in the fallback IDP. Do you have a So the question is, uh, by building this bridge, do you think that it makes it less likely for Google to actually uh, do native support? Um, I, d I don't think so, because I think, uh, I think Gmail would, will be able to provide a better user experience um, if they don't have a bridge. And they will also be able to control the whole flow, as opposed to like, having a middleman in, in the middle. I think, um, I, I, think, like, I, th I think it would still uh, make sense for them to, uh, to have native support. Uh, in terms of whether or not the G Google that we've talked to Google about it, uh, we've talked to Google about Persona, uh, but like we haven't talked about like, hey, you know, can we sit down with you guys and you know we can do this this weekend and kind of thing? But we haven't done that yet. No, we we were kind of like we're we're the the native support. We're rolling it out internally for Mozilla, and uh, and and we're kind of like we're we're pretty satisfied with it now. Um, but yeah, it was it was a bit early. Hold on. So that's for that's for browser support though, right? Yes. Yeah. For native support in the browser. Yeah. Um, yeah he was asking Gmail for Gmail. Yeah. Sorry, that's a different yeah. That I have about. Okay. So just to repeat what he said, um, he said that he has talked to uh, the the Chrome guys and they're interested in identity in the browser. They're just not sure which protocol um, is right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>